Welcome to Money Matters TV. I'm Mike Dever, founder and CEO of Brandywine Asset Management. And my co-host today is Jeff Watkinson of Watkinson Capital Advisors. They are municipal bond specialists. And our guest today is Eric Parnell, the CFA of Great Valley Advisors. Well, hello, Jeff. Hey, Mike, how are you? Real good, thank you. Uh, I think we talked a couple months ago and we had some uh, activity in the muni bond market, um, bond market in general. And I guess the, what have you been seeing recently, sub, you know, subsequent to that uh, last conversation we had? Great question, Mike. Here we are in the final quarter of 2023. And I think the last time we spoke, it was right around August when there was a lot of fear in the municipal bond market and there was a lot of selling. And as you know, with bonds, um, when people sell, prices go down, yields go up. And at the beginning of August, we saw we were seeing the highest yields in municipal muni land since 2008, like pre-financial crisis. Right. And you know, we it, it, there were even higher yields than we saw in the previous year, 2022. And I'm writing newsletters, I'm posting on LinkedIn, I'm talking to our clients. You know, now's if you're thinking about municipal bonds, you have money in CDs, money market bond funds, you're looking to upgrade. Now would be a great time to look at it. This was the beginning of August. And guess what happens in August? The market gets softer. Right. And then what happens in September? The market got even softer. It seemed like every week, whatever you bought last week was a little cheaper this week. And that went through October. October was the fourth worst month in municipal bond history wow so exactly. it was three months of fear panic selling after this announcement i mean this, this level in early august and like we're pounding the table we're writing notes um on november 14th jp morgan wrote an article saying we are seeing equity like returns yields with tax equivalent yields in muni land and they wrote that research piece so guess what happened in november we had a monster rally the biggest on record um you know that rubber band got pushed 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 <clears throat> it's it snapped back huge rally in november were, and, uh, yeah, so were you able to convince clients you know emotionally were they able to to buy those yields or were they did they wait until yields started coming back down again and the market rallied? A, a little bit of both. Okay. Um, we, we, had, we had a fair amount of new money come in um, from new clients. We've had existing clients give more money. And then there were other people who are, hey, let's talk after Thanksgiving or let's talk in a couple of weeks. And I'm always straddling the line like, hey, like, you may not want to wait. I mean, it's, it's this good. Right. And I mean, I was saying that in August and things got softer, 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 but, but it was still a good point to buy. I mean, it, it was still it, a great time to buy. Yeah. It's, it, it's uh, it, right. It's difficult in your position, I guess, to see an opportunity like that, that maybe doesn't come around that often. And so now you're pounding the table. You don't want to sound like you're, aggressively pitching something but the reality is it's probably something you hadn't been doing for years but now you had the opportunity so you're telling the people this is the opportunity this is the time not everybody responds that's why i was curious is if you got much uh, response out of that people seem like they like to chase things rather than take advantage of an opportunity <laughs> yeah and i i try to just tell it the way it is i mean i i like to post on linkedin and i posted exactly what I said to you. You know, I, I said two months ago, these are the best levels we've seen. And guess what? It's gotten cheaper. Right. And uh, right. you don't want to be too, I don't, I'm not comfortable being too aggressive. Like here's the situation. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, be no, objective with it. So what, what, what should the, the people that are buying be thinking about when they're buying muni bonds? What are some of the key, um, points to to keep in mind <clears throat> good question uh when you buy a municipal bond it, 
it's kind of like watching your favorite movie. Um, you know how the story ends, but you need to understand how the bond works. You need to understand the structure of the bond. And that's really about, you know, how much is the bond, how much bond interest am I going to receive? When am I going to receive it? And when does the bond mature? When, excuse me, when, when will I get my money back? And when you, when you say, you know, the story ends, you know, that you, what yield you're getting or you do. And now you need to know the details or. Exactly. You, you got to understand. I mean, if you understand, if, you know, if you understand the bond, you need to understand the structure of the bond. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And once you understand the structure of the bond, you know how the story ends. You okay. know when you'll receive your interest. You know when you'll get your capital back. Um, I would really, the second thing I'd really be careful with is the, the rating of the bond. Uh, unless you're an expert, um, I would stick to investment grade. Uh, we stick with investment grades. We do not invest in non-rated or below investment grade ratings. And the other thing is the level, the level of that purchase, what yield you're getting. Is that a good yield? Is that a good level? Um, has that bond been marked up? Because when you buy that bond at, say, a 350 yield to maturity, that's going to be your you know, annual return, your annual yield until that bond matures. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the... The, the fact right now that we have a lot of debt issuance by the federal government, huge deficits, $33 trillion in debt, how is that affecting the municipal bond market? The simple answer is um, state and local governments, local authorities that issue municipal bonds, they have to have a balanced budget, while the federal government does not. Um, these state and local governments, you know, the, the, if it's a GO, a general obligation bond, where their services, their operations are financed through taxation, um, people can vote with their feet. They, they can't overtax their citizens because people can vote with their feet and move. So, and secondly, these state and local governments and authorities Post 2008, they set up rainy day reserve funds for in case there's a financial crisis or in case um, it just in case there's a rainy day and they need mm -hmm. the money. So most of these state and local governments, unlike the federal government, they're very prudent in their fiscal management and they have reserves and yeah. the federal government is a mess. Yeah, right. yeah. So they, they operate more like you or I would operate and run a family. Uh, they, they, they have to balance. Uh, they've got to manage their debt. They, they can't just run it up and expect somebody to keep bailing them out. That's absolutely yeah. right. They're, they're yeah. very prudent. And, and some, some states are better at it than others. And okay. You always got to remember, Mike, there's 50 different states. There's 50 different markets. Um, Illinois. Yeah. I mean, the poster child for fiscal irresponsibility. I mean, even they've kind of gotten their act together and have had a couple upgrades, you know, over the last several years. Okay. So, I mean, there's and, some states are better than others. And, and working with someone like you, I guess you'll help guide the people through the, the various offerings that are there and whether the yield is the proper yield for that risk of taking and uh, it kind of help guide them. Well, we do, we do have one question here from, it's uh, Robert Abbott, Abbott of Philadelphia. What does laddering bonds mean? Oh, good question, Robert. I like it. Laddering bonds. Think of a ladder. Ladders have rungs. And I, I read this online that every rung must have an interval of 10 to 14 inches. It's, it's a standard. So essentially, laddering bonds means you take a, a portfolio of bonds and you set the maturities at different intervals. So it might be every year, say you have $500,000, every year $100,000 worth of bonds will mature. So it puts not only the investor, but also the advisor, you know, 
onto a, you're not trying to time the market. You're on a system. You're in a process of investing in municipal bond, excuse me, any fixed income security. Right. Um, whether it's CDs, corporates, or municipal bonds. And but it sounds like that would also provide just diversification, but naturally as well then. Absolutely. A absolutely. Um, the risk, obviously, is reinvestment risk. Um, and that can be good or bad because when you have $100,000 worth of capital to reinvest, rates may be higher, which is would be good, or they might be a lot lower um, and you would earn less interest. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, Money Matters TV does take audience questions. If you are interested, here's how to send your questions in to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, we're bringing in our guest today, which is Eric Parnell <coughs> of Great Valley Advisors. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Or Eric, I'm sorry. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and Jeff, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today on Money Matters TV. Hey, can you give me just a quick background? I, I, I know we have some other questions I want to hit on here, but a uh, quick background on how you got into your business. Um, how did you become interested in finance and, and what type of um, clients is it that you're serving? Absolutely. Well, my, my path has definitely been a little bit unconventional. I actually started in the industry as an economist. I was a, a microeconomist micro working down in Washington, D.C. and antitrust and made my way back up to the Philadelphia area working as a macroeconomist uh, in the late 1990s. Um, you know, from there, I got on uh, working in investment communications, basically with, uh, you know, for an investment uh, management team, uh, providing uh, investment communications to their advisors and their clients. Um, and then in 2005, I started my own registered investment advisor. And at the same time, I became a full time professor, first at Westchester University and then at her sinus college. So that was the stretch of time from 2005 all the way up to 2022. Um, and in 2022, I made the decision. I said, you know, it's I, I don't want to be independent anymore. Um, I'm a registered investment advisor and the world has become more complicated in terms of uh, compliance, technology needs, back office support, um, you know, fee processing. So I reached out to a firm called Great Valley Advisor Group. And along the way, basically, they found out the type of work that I was doing in terms of asset allocation modeling and economic research. Um, so I, in bringing my RIA into the Great Valley Advisor Group community, I uh, became their chief market strategist. So in my That's work at, at GVA, building investment models and serving our advisor clients all across the country. Okay, so then you are the right person to ask about <laughs> the outlook on the economy, business, markets, you know, in general, what do you, what do you see happening? What, what's coming on? Um, what's on board for the next year for us? Well, you know, it's really been an interesting time. You know, you think about where we've, where we've been coming off of the financial crisis. And we had 13 years where we had interest rates pinned effectively at 0%. At a time when economic growth was it was it was positive, but it was chronically sluggish. So we, we had this constant back and forth of disinflation, if not outright deflation, um, slow economic growth and always a concern that the Federal Reserve would need to step in and provide monetary policy support to protect us from the next crisis. But then we had covid and we had the extraordinary policy response to covid which in its aftermath, it was so extraordinary that it helped spark a pretty sizable inflation outbreak that we've had over the last couple of years. So we had for the first time since the 1970s, culminating in 2022, an extremely difficult market environment, not only for equities, but also for bonds at the same time. Now, in 2023, we've seen a fairly strong recovery in the stock market. 
Um, but it's been a middling performance for the bond market. And as you know, uh, you and Jeff were talking about earlier, um, it's tough last few months, basically August, September, and October, uh, a difficult time in terms of you know, equity market returns, but also particularly in the fixed income market. But as we head into the end of the year, um, you know, I'm no stranger to downside risk. I'm no stranger to, to being bearish and recognizing where risk uh, exists in the marketplace. But I would say I'm probably about as constructive as I've been on both equities and bonds and capital markets in general as I've been in years. You know, we have an economy that has proven resilient in 2023. You know, all the expectations going into the 2023 calendar year was, OK, recession by the second half of 2023. Well, that never really materialized. I mean, we have a labor market that's been fairly tight. We have a housing market that's held up well. And now we're in a phase where, you know, although economic growth is slowing somewhat, we have improving corporate earnings, uh, corporate profit margins are widening. And probably the most important element is inflationary pressures continue to subside, both on the headline and the core basis. So the 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 setup is is favorable not only for stocks but also for bonds as we go into 2024. So, so likely above average type performance for stocks and bonds over the next 12 months. Yeah, I think I if if you had if I had to choose between stocks or bonds in terms of what I'm even more excited about, I'm even more constructive on the bond market than I am on the stock market. Um, you know, we had uh, inflation peak in the summer of 2022 on a headline basis, and then peaked on the core in the fall of 2022. And inflationary pressures were increasingly coming down. And we saw a bond market rally that we would expect to see um, coming off the October lows into the spring <coughs> of 2023. But then the bond market rolled over. And as Jeff talked about earlier in the, um, in the show, it was a particularly tough stretch you know, basically that period from July all the way through to the end of October, where we saw the 10 year Treasury yield push its way all the way up to 5 percent. But this was taking place in an environment where inflation was coming down. And given that inflation is a primary determinant of bond market returns, um, that suggested that a real opportunity was starting to come together. Now, we've seen a swift decline in Treasury yields, you know, bond, bond yields come down, bond prices go up. So it's been a heck of a rally um, in Treasuries and the bond market in general through the month of November and into December. Um, but th there's still a fair amount of room in our view in terms of inflation continuing to come down, get into a glide path, um, but to be supportive of continued bond market upside as we go into the new year. Eric, I got a I got a question for you. Um, it's, it sounds like you're saying the backdrop for U.S. U.S. domestic equities and fixed income is favorable. Mm -hmm. What are your views on international emerging markets, uh, equity stocks? How are you in corporate? What, what's your view on international investing right now? No, that's a great question because you know one of the challenges associated with investing outside of the U.S. It's a theme we've heard for years is, you know, the great value that exists in developed international markets or emerging markets relative to the U.S. I mean, we can go all the way back to 2010 and 2011, and we had a divergence where the U.S. equity market continued to rise year after year outside of, you know, periods, short term periods of correction. But developed international markets and emerging markets, they, they effectively languished. Um, it's been over a decade of sideways performance and sideways returns. Um, so a, a, an attractive relative value opportunity has really been presenting itself for years. Um, but it's been an exercise in frustration for investors trying to capture that relative value opportunity because the U.S. bias continues to be rewarded. Um, we've continued to see U.S. markets outperform developed international and emerging markets. So the question is, you know, OK, that value is there. You know, there's attractive opportunities in these markets. One, does it make sense to try to capture them now? I mean, when is this inflection point going to finally take place? And two, if we were to seek to capitalize on it now or seek to position for it now, what would be the reasons and the catalysts that would cause for this change to take place you know, potentially in the coming year or in the next few years. And I would say the biggest thing is the change in the policy environment. You know, all the way up until the early 2022, we had a Fed funds rate that was effectively trapped at zero percent. 
and we had chronic disinflation. But because of the inflation outbreak that we saw in 2022, and we're coming down from it in 2023, that finally broke the monetary policy fever. We have a Fed funds rate that's above 5% for the first time since before the financial crisis. It's, it was a difficult stretch that we went through from 2021 to 2023 in terms of the outbreak of inflation. But the silver lining associated with that as we go through go towards the middle of the decade is it allowed for policy normalization. It allowed for monetary policy to get back in a normal course where we're talking about 2% to 3% inflation on a sustained basis going forward. And we're talking about monetary policy. We're, we're not talking about negative interest rates in certain markets across the country any, or across the world anymore. We're talking about normal finance and, and the normal application of fundamental analysis in our investment decision-making process. So, so Eric, how, how is that? Yeah. How is that favorable for the emerging markets more so than it is for the developed markets? And, and another question or comment, I guess, it seems like uh, it, these emerging markets in, in my history seem like they're always emerging. When do they oh, become developed? <laughs> no, a lot of great questions there. So the first thing is, you know, I, you know, I would continue to, I would continue to overweight U.S. relative to, to, to developed international and emerging. I think, I think the U.S. bias continues to get rewarded. And yes, the U.S. stock market has done really well in 2023, but a lot of those positive returns have been concentrated in seven stocks. You, you know, you take away the so-called magnificent seven that make up about 85 percent of the positive return in the S&P 500 this year. And the rest of the market has been largely left behind. And that not only includes mid cap U.S. stocks and small, small cap U.S. stocks, but a good portion of the S&P 500 outside of those maybe seven or 12 names at the top of the index. So. I think there's a tremendous upside opportunity in the U.S., not only from a fundamental improvement in terms of corporate earnings and profit margins, but we're seeing value in certain areas of the U.S. equity market, mid caps and small caps, discounted values that we haven't seen in decades. So, you know, we continue to favor the U.S. Um, in terms of developed international um, and, and emerging markets in particular, one has to be selective. Um you know, and you make a really good point about emerging markets, because one of what I would contend to be is the misperceptions about how to allocate to emerging markets. When we allocate the stocks in the U.S., we think of the S&P 500 index and, you know, it provides a representation, a market cap weighted representation of the biggest stocks in the U.S. So the the notion among many investors is that, well, if we want to invest in emerging markets, we should just be market cap weighted to emerging markets. But I don't necessarily subscribe that that's the best way to do that, because just because an economy and its market may be very big outside of the U.S. Um, doesn't mean that that's necessarily an attractive investment opportunity because the regulatory environment, the rule of law and how it's applied in that economy may not be a place where capital is going to be treated well and a place where we want to allocate capital. But most emerging market indices will place a heavy overweight um, to an economy like China, for example, um, which has seen really challenged performance and, you know, a pretty challenging economic environment over the last few years. So one of the ways that we seek to allocate to markets outside of the U.S., particularly emerging markets, um, is to not be so benchmark dependent and instead focus on economies that we would refer to as being in transition, economies that maybe are coming out of autocracy and are seeking to transition more to democracy and economic freedom and the adaption of the rule of law. Uh, because there's a fair amount of research that suggests that those economies and the markets in those economies have been able to deliver relative outperformance to the emerging market benchmark and to, to global XUS benchmarks with uh, meaningfully less risk uh, performance over time. Thanks, Eric. Um, I got a question for you. Absolutely. Um, you know, concerning the global economy, concerning the U.S. economy, let's make it very broad. Uh, you know, what are the biggest downside risks that you're seeing? Risk, you know, risks out there that you're seeing. You know, what's keeping you up at night? Uh, can you can you expand upon that a little, please? Absolutely. So. 
The biggest downside risk, in my view, is the biggest downside risk going into the second half of the year, and it continues to be in, going into 2024, is the renewed outbreak of inflation. One of the biggest keys to the equity market rally and the bond market rally in the second half of 2023 and for the remainder of 2023, that is, and into 2024, is the fact that inflation continues to come down. If we enter into a market environment in 2024, an economic environment where inflationary pressures start to rise, you know, a repeat of some of the things that we saw in the 1970s, where inflation would come down and then all of a sudden it would shoot back up again, that presents a real dilemma for equity markets and for the fixed income markets, because it means the it means monetary policymakers will have to get back to aggressively raising interest rates. You know, um, if we see an, a renewed rise in inflationary pressures, um, that would be arguably, in my view, the biggest downside risk. Another downside risk that gets talked about, but I think needs to be considered in context, is the threat of geopolitical events. They can be uh, shocking to the equity market in the short term, the you know bond markets in general and the treasury market in particular tends to do well when you have geopolitical shock events like um, you know what we saw in the Middle East here back at the uh, beginning of October. But they tend to be fleeting. You know you'll see a short term correction five, six, seven percent as much, maybe even more. Um, but more often than not, two to three weeks after the outbreak of the event, unless it's really dramatic, um, we tend to see the equity market rebound. So um, when we hear about things like whether it's a geopolitical event or dis dysfunction in Washington from a political perspective, that can cause short-term market shocks. But I think investors would be well served to see those types of shocks as, as opportunities to basically buy in and add to positions when they take place. So, so that, <clears throat> that I, I guess your underlying thesis of um, it's going to be a powerful kind of environment, a positive environment holds even through the the shocks that you're seeing because you see those as maybe being more transient let me know if i'm wrong on that but then yeah. my one last question we just have another minute here um sure. are, how would <laughs> investors invest in these international emerging markets versus u.s markets do they buy a broad global index uh or that that encompasses the, the entire globe or do they have some individual countries that you think specifically should they should focus on yeah, I think I think in the uh, you know in the U.S. Uh, differentiating by size, I think being style a style neutral growth versus value is a good way to go in this in this market environment. I think the current market environment over the next five years favors value over growth, but that's probably marginal at best. Um, in international markets, I think when it comes to developed international markets, a more passive approach, um, maybe with a little bit of alpha generation tied into it, a little bit of an active overlay is a good way to do it. When it comes to emerging markets, you have to be a lot more selective in, in, in our view that um, it's not necessarily just buying the market cap weight because there is such a differentiation between the economies that exist in emerging markets, you want to identify a manager who can really pick and choose what they think the best markets are to be able to add value for your portfolios. Okay, so something that's more of an active manager than a passive index. And we're seeing that in the US as well, just over the last couple of years, these big divergences, as you're pointing out, between value and growth, Magnificent Seven dominating the market over everything else. So it's really gotten to be where if you're, if you're in a broad market index, you're gonna capture some of that. If you're picking wrong, you could be flat instead of up 20% on the year. Absolutely. So, Eric, I really appreciate it and your insight and uh, your the, the vast amount of knowledge you bring and your background to this. Uh, uh, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. Very good. Um, and our next guest on Money Matters TV is Adam Battersby, president of Pro Batter Sports. Thank you for watching Money Matters TV. And uh, we look forward to having you back next time where your money matters. Thank you.